Sparta. We were taken from our homes as children and raised in the Agoji. We marched though we drowned, fought for scraps or starved. Our elders beat us till we could not stand. At night, we made our way home, alone, or were food for wolves. That is how Spartans are made. Considering how Spartans are made, it's no wonder you turned out as you did. Your fate was sealed from the start. Fate can be overcome. I used to think so. When the Norns told me of my son's fate, I thought I could change it. You know well how that worked out. The Norns? The fates of these lands? That's right. You defy prophecy at your own peril. Hey there, welcome to the Lord to Death podcast. My name's Brett, and today I want to talk about God of War, what happened in between the events of God of War 3 and the 2018 reboot, and how Kratos got to Norse mythology's Midgard from ancient Greece. God of War is one of the rare series where the reboot is widely considered better than the original. I'm sure that's partly due to the difference in genre between the two, the originals being a hack and slash RPG whose main focus was on combat, gore, and generating as much testosterone as humanly possible, whereas the reboot was a narrative-driven RPG that focuses more on storytelling than it cares about being flashy. I personally love the revenge-fueled, no-quarter Kratos that we get in the originals, but I think the reboot offered a fresh new perspective and turned a certified anti-hero into a real hero who's trying to do the right thing for everyone rather than just the right thing for himself. The series is near and dear to my heart, and the fact that they were able to come back almost a decade later and make two near-perfect games makes my heart pretty happy, because that doesn't tend to happen too often with reboots. As always with the show, I want to stick to the facts as much as possible, but in this particular story there are several key details missing. Between the games, the novelization, and the comic God of War Fallen God, we get a pretty good idea about how Kratos made the journey into another pantheon. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Kratos and give a brief history of who the famed Ghost of Sparta is through the events of God of War 1 through 3. As his nickname implies, Kratos was born in Sparta, a city-state in Greece. His father was the big man himself, Zeus, and his mother was a mortal woman named Callisto. So that makes Kratos a demigod, giving him strength and agility that far surpasses that of a regular man. It's because of this, largely, that he was able to climb through the ranks of the Spartans in his adulthood and become such a renowned warrior before his godhood. He had a brother named Demos, also a demigod, who Kratos was very close to. They would spar and train daily to prepare themselves for joining the Spartan army, but unfortunately Demos didn't make it that far. Deimos would later be abducted in a raid on their village orchestrated by the god of war Ares and given to the god of death Thanatos to avoid a prophecy that a marked one would destroy Olympus. They chose Deimos because he was a demigod born with an unusual birthmark that covered most of his body. If you've played the games or you are familiar with Kratos, then you would recognize the marks as Kratos would eventually clad himself in red tattoos in the same pattern as a sort of tribute to his brother, which made the prophecy true in the end. Deimos was killed much later by Thanatos before Kratos was able to slay the god of death. This was one of the two major catalysts that would set Kratos on a warpath against the Greek pantheon. Ares wanted to kill Kratos as well and finish the bloodline, but he ended up living at the request of the goddess Athena, and eventually joined the Spartan army like he said he would. Later in life, Kratos married a woman named Lysandra and had a daughter, Calliope. So he had a wife, a child, and he was in the Spartan army. What more could he have wanted? Eventually, he rose through the ranks, killing several of the gods' champions, drawing attention to himself from Olympus, and gaining the rank of captain and given an army of his own after multiple successful battles. But of course, he can't win them all. Afterwards, in a losing battle with an army from the east, Kratos called upon Ares to aid him. He begged the god to not let him lose and offered Ares whatever he wanted if he could help. Ares accepted and slew the army. He gave Kratos the iconic Blades of Chaos, and in exchange, Kratos had to give his life to Ares in servitude. He would go into battle for Ares on multiple occasions, killing whoever needed it at the god's behest. One day, on another quest for Ares, he was instructed to raid a temple and slay all the inhabitants. Unfortunately, Kratos did not know that his wife and child were there, and so in a fit of rage, he ended up slaying his family. This was orchestrated by Ares to have Kratos cut all mortal ties with the world so that he would basically be the perfect puppet for him. That same day, Kratos was cursed by an oracle, forced to wear the ashes of his family, giving him the pale white skin tone that we're so familiar with, granting him the title, Ghost of Sparta. This is where Kratos vowed to kill Ares for making him commit such atrocities, and was the second catalyst to him going on a warpath against the Greek pantheon, which led to him opening Pandora's box to gain the power of a god and killing pretty well every other god and demigod. 
Are you sick of the word God yet? The effect of his rage echoed through the heavens until distant gods learned of the ghost of Sparta and learned to fear him. Now, I won't go over the entire events of God of War 1 through 3, but our story today begins with the end of God of War 3. Long story short, Kratos, after killing his father Zeus, was left empty. He had devoted so many years of his life to killing gods that he didn't know what to do with himself afterwards, and he felt like he had no place in this world after what he had done. His final act was to commit suicide, and he was left to die on Mount Olympus. Or so we were led to believe, as that was the end of the game. Kratos had previously made attempts on his life to no success, which makes the ending fairly ambiguous. At the time, I was certain that he had died, gotten peace, and there was no room for another sequel, which felt perfect for the time. Kratos had done everything that he had set out to do, and realistically, there was no way to shoehorn him into another adventure without throwing him headfirst into another pantheon to slay. But, eight years later, we received the self-titled God of War in 2018, which is a total reboot of the series, featuring Kratos in the midst of Norse mythology. We begin that game with a funeral for his late wife, Faye, alongside his son, Atreus. So, that begs the question, how exactly did Kratos get to Midgard, and why does he have a new family? In the real world, there is no Midgard, but I can assume that it would be somewhere in Norway. And just a disclaimer, I am not a historian, and this is based on some quick research that I did, and therefore it may not be entirely accurate. But for the sake of some quick maths that we're going to do, I'm going to assume it was somewhere in Norway. So if Kratos were to walk and stumble upon it, he would be walking north approximately 3,090 kilometers, which is about a 50-day journey, assuming that he's walking at a decent pace for about 12 hours a day and never strayed from the path. We know that this isn't possible, nor was it the case, and that his journey was far longer than that. In the comic, God of War Fallen God, we see Kratos take a boat from Greece at the end of God of War 3 and set sail for the open sea. Eventually, after an unknown stretch of time, he ends up in Egypt. So it turns out I was right, and that there was no continuing the story without chucking him into another pantheon. So let's talk about this comic a little bit and talk about Kratos' time in Egypt and where that kind of led to. We start the comic with Kratos at the edge of a cliff. He's trying to rid himself of the Blades of Chaos and therefore rid himself of his past. But as we see, every time that he tries to get rid of them, they end up coming back to him one way or another. So if he can't get rid of his past, then he's going to sail away and find somewhere new. Wandering for days and nights on end, he's becoming increasingly frustrated with his inability to rid himself of his past, and he ends up stumbling upon a small village where the villagers immediately run in fear at the sight of him. One man recognizes him as the ghost of Sparta and prattles on about how Kratos' destiny lies in the land of the pharaohs. After months of traveling in the desert, Kratos finds a refuge in an oasis, where he is confronted by the first of many talking animals that he confronts in this land, a monkey. He was talking to him about his destiny and how he should embrace his destiny. More months pass, and Kratos is still being haunted by his past and continually tries to get rid of the Blades of Chaos. Try as he may to stay awake, every time he lets his consciousness slip, the blades appear by his side once more. Kratos then finds himself talking with another animal who has the body of a man and the head of an ibis, a kind of bird with a long beak and beady little eyes. So the comic doesn't say it outright, but I have a feeling that this would be Thoth, god of the moon, master of knowledge, and patron of scribes. So, two interesting points about Thoth. One, their direct equivalent in the Greek pantheon would be Hermes. And the second, their Egyptian name was Jehudi, which means he who is like an ibis. So this bird man says, destiny is the destination you reach, no matter what direction you travel. At your journey's end, you find exactly where you belong. Everyone keeps talking to Kratos about destiny, and Kratos is sick of it at this point. He's lived his entire life with people telling him his destiny, and he's trying to make a path for himself. Afterwards, Kratos finally allows himself to fall asleep. He awakens in a dream to find himself in front of a statue of Athena, who is also talking to him about destiny. She tells him to return home, to fulfill his purpose. The same old man that he met before in the village tells him that there's a battle yet to come and that he needs to be prepared for it. Kratos finds himself back in that same village, and the villagers are now running from a giant crocodile instead of him. Kratos is extremely unsympathetic at first, cursing the gods and threatening to kill villagers out of spite. But in the end, he ends up fighting the giant crocodile before the villagers are running yet again, and this time from a giant hippo. He fails to fight the hippo and falls unconscious. In his dreams, he's once again confronted by Athena, but this time she has everyone that he's met so far in Egypt. The old man, the monkey, and Thoth, 
and of course they are talking to him about destiny and how Kratos is fleeing his purpose and how he needs to fulfill his purpose. Eventually, Kratos succumbs to the talks of destiny and how he needs to fulfill his purpose, picks up the Blades of Chaos, wakes up again, and goes to fight the hippo. This time, he succeeds and slays the hippo. But as he's laying in the sand, the old man comes up to him again and says that his path carries him away from Egypt, and that he still has a sense of purpose elsewhere. Kratos is just distraught by this. He doesn't want destiny. He doesn't want to have to do anything. And that's basically where the comic ends. Kratos is in the middle of Egypt. He has once again succumbed to his rage and is torn by the fact that he let destiny control him again. While it's a short comic, I think it's important for two main reasons. One, we see that Kratos is actively trying to change who he is. He's sick of being consumed by his rage and destroying everything in his wake for the sake of his own personal gain, and he wants to make amends for essentially destroying Greece. Two, we establish that Kratos can not only interact with Greek gods outside of Greece, in this case, Athena is the only one that we know of that's alive, but he can also interact with gods outside his pantheon. We see him come into contact with Thoth multiple times in this comic, and there are people within and there are people within Egypt who recognize Kratos for his exploits in Greece. I think that this is interesting because it implies that gods acknowledge others outside of their own realm and can travel beyond their jurisdiction into other lands, which brings us to our next topic, God of War 2018 and Ragnarok. We know from dialogue within Ragnarok that Kratos' god powers that he gained in the events of God of War 1 through 3 do not work in the Nine Realms aside from his physical strength and immortality. Kratos mentions this on the boat while he's with Atreus and Mimir in one of the filler dialogue areas. I personally heard this on Svartalheim, but you might have heard it elsewhere. And as Cory Barlog mentioned in an interview a number of years ago, gods in this world exist in their own sort of pocket dimensions. What gods do in one land doesn't necessarily have an effect on those in other lands. For instance, when Kratos releases Famine and Plague from Pandora's box, that was contained to Greece and didn't cause some sort of global apocalypse. We also know that Tyr, the god of war within Norse mythology, knew about Kratos as the ghost of Sparta, as we see inside Tyr's temple. Kratos and Atreus find artifacts from Greece, among other realms, like Japanese, Egyptian, Mayan, and Celtic artifacts. Kratos' artifact was an amphora, which is basically a jar, depicting Kratos with his signature Blades of Chaos. On the back, it looks like a broken pantheon is being rebuilt, which would mean that Tyr went to Greece after the events of God of War 3, after Kratos releases the Power of Hope, which allows them to restore Greece. So this tells us that Tyr is able to go to realms beyond the Nine in Norse mythology. We know that Tyr built the temple in the Lake of the Nine to allow faster and more fluent travel between the Nine Realms, and it's entirely possible that he used something like the Unity Stone, which was made as a key to gain access to the Jotunheim Gate through the Realm Between Realms, to access the rest of the world. This would probably take form of hidden gates only visible to those who have Bifrost eyes, similar to Mimir and Tyr. And big spoilers for Ragnarok, when Kratos finds the real Tyr in the postgame, Tyr recognizes the name, but he can't quite put a finger on where he knows it from. Clearly much time has passed since he had visited Greece, which would imply it's probably been a couple hundred years or so since he was imprisoned. But there is no definite timeline on that, and it's hard to know exactly how much time passed between him going to Greece and the events of Ragnarok. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of information within the game that tells us how Kratos actually got to Midgard. But we do get some interesting tidbits from the novelization of God of War 2018. After traveling for days, weeks, and months after the events of Fallen God, Kratos finds himself in an encounter with three wolves. He describes them as twice his height, which is impressive considering that he himself stands about 6 foot 4 inches. His height is varied throughout the games, from 6 to 7 feet tall, but Santa Monica Studios has confirmed that in the reboot, he is 6 foot 4. A weird detail for sure, but at least we know that Kratos wouldn't have any trouble in the modern dating scene. Fending off the wolves with his blades, Kratos fails to discourage the beasts from attacking. When they make their advance, Kratos notices that behind them is a woman clad in a long cloak and cowl obscuring most of her face. As he screams for her to tell him who she is, one of the wolves grabs him by the thigh and drags him away. All we know past this point is that he wakes up in Midgard and starts his life there. Here is where we need to do a little bit of theorizing to fill in the gaps with what we know. Obviously, there are massive spoilers past this point, so listen at your own discretion. I'm going to say outright with confidence that the woman controlling the wolves was almost definitely Faye, the woman who Kratos ends up marrying. Faye, being a giant who was gifted with foresight and had a tendency to throw wrenches in the Aesir god's plans, I think that makes the most sense, seeing as she and Tyr would have as much reason as any to bring a certified god killer into the world to take on Odin. 
Tyr, having the ability to travel beyond his realm and into others, knew about Kratos and how he fell the Greek gods and would have the means to locate him to bring about their vengeance, considering Odin was the reason that the giants were all but wiped out. The wolves are likely to have been Fenrir, Skull, and Hati, and Tyr is the only one that who we know that had any positive interactions with Fenrir before his imprisonment in Helheim. This theory is strengthened by the novelization where, in Tyr's temple, Kratos recognizes the wolves from a painting when they had not yet met them in-game. If it is true that Faye was behind bringing Kratos into Midgard, that makes their marriage so much more tragic. That would likely mean that the only reason she married him was for the sake of destiny, and we know how much Kratos loves fate. She finds him in the woods, makes sure that he falls in love with her, and bears his child in a decades-long scheme to take down Odin and the other Aesir gods. It's possible that, over time, she fell for him as well, but in this case, it would be more likely that the marriage was all for personal gain. If that doesn't make you depressed, nothing will. Again, that much is a theory, and we don't have any evidence that would further support that other than what have already gone over. Maybe in a future show, movie, or game, we'll get some more answers, but that's all we really have for now. So, long story short, it would seem that Kratos wandered endlessly for a period of time, found himself in an encounter with some wolves in the woods, and was abducted by a giant lady who wanted to marry him and bear his children. When you put it that way, it, it doesn't sound great at all. But I'd love to hear what you think. Do you think that Kratos' late wife was the reason he was there at all, or do you think it could have been someone else? For all we know, it could have been Freya, but that seems less likely seeing as she was locked to Midgard as per Odin's spell. I personally think this is a pretty strong theory, and it's supported by a lot of evidence in-game. We're only filling in minor gaps, such as the persons actually involved. But you can find us online, at lord to death on your favorite social media and podcast websites. If you have any ideas, then let me know, and they could become an episode. Until then, stay safe, have a great day wherever you are, and I'll talk your ear off next time. See ya.